welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Pixelated Sausage Show. Hi, hi, hi. I am, of course, your host, Mark Kushnez, and today I've got uh, to slip off the uh, edge of my desk, uh, my elbow. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. But, uh, got some games to talk about, of course, as well as a TV show and I guess a movie that I've rewatched, which then got me to watch the show. And that movie is The Suicide Squad. I believe the is in it, right? The James Gunn one, the newest one. I think the first one, the David Ayer one, was just Suicide Squad. And it was one of the worst comic book movies I've ever seen. And Suicide Squad, The Suicide Squad, The Suicide Squad, starring Idris Elba instead of Will Smith and Margot Robbie instead of Margot Robbie. It's a, uh, it's grown on me. The first time I watched it, I found maybe 25%, if that, of the jokes to land and actually amuse me and get me to go, ha 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 ha. I don't do that regardless if I think something's funny. If I think something's funny, I'm like, internally, in my head, that was funny. That's how I react to comedy. I rarely ever actually physically, <clears throat> outwardly laugh or show any signs of finding something amusing. But uh, upon a rewatch, which I did after failing to rewatch a whole bunch of other stuff, including Teen Wolf, Tank Girl, I don't remember what else. There was a whole bunch of stuff in there that I tried watching. And I was like, nope, nope, nope. Next, next, next. And I fell upon the Suicide Squad. After, that's right. After failing to give, or not failing to, I did try and give Birds of Prey another shot. Since so many people like that. But I don't know if it's Margot Robbie's take on Harley Quinn, I think she is good at doing the mannerisms and I just, I can't stand her as a lead character, as an additional character, as part of an ensemble, she's okay. Even then, she's probably the weakest part of the Suicide Squad. I'd have to really think about it, but I'm I'm not a fan of her Harley Quinn, even though I think she's a really good Harley Quinn. It doesn't make any fucking sense, but I think she gets the voice, she has the look, and it's maybe the writing? They just do not know how to write for her? I, I don't know what the problem is. But she really does not work for me in any of the live action movies, whether she's the lead in something like Birds of Prey or part of an ensemble in either Suicide Squad movie. She's a, a lot more tolerable in the ensemble pieces, but still the weaker part of those movies. But when I rewatched The Suicide Squad, I was surprised by how much. I enjoyed it, which I think is being a little bit too generous. I didn't, I didn't love it or anything, but I did have an overall good time with it. That may have been helped greatly by the bunch of shit I watched prior to it, like Birds of Prey and... That may have been the day I also tried to watch Transformers Revenge of the Fallen Wherever, the second one, because the first one isn't available on any streaming platform for free. And, and, and all those other movies. Out. Teen Wolf, whoo, Weird Science. What else? There's, there's other stuff. I was looking at a few of my Blu-ray that I was on the fence as to whether or not I wanted to keep or put into my cell pile and those aforementioned ones are going to be sold. I was surprised to see how much Tank Girl is going for, but uh, 
I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. But the, the real good thing that came about from all of this was, and I was planning to watch this at some point regardless because Conan, one of my friends, that's not his real name. Not that that matters, but he highly recommended Peacemaker, which I remember seeing the trailer for and thinking, eh, this could maybe be okay, but I really didn't like Cena in the Suicide Squad. I didn't like the Suicide Squad, and I'm assuming this is just going to be more of that and more of a bunch of humor that doesn't land, but he was a really big fan of it. He really championed it, talked it up, was in the same boat as me in terms of the movie. So the fact that he enjoyed the show as much as he did and recommended it as highly as he did, given that he, like me, did not like the movie, that put it on my radar. That made it something I was going to watch at some point. And, and thus, rewatching The Suicide Squad, it made perfect sense to lead or, or for that to lead into my finally watching of Peacemaker because I had finished Deep Space Nine, was looking for something else to watch, didn't want to jump into another Star Trek series that was going to take me a month or two to get through. And holy crap, Peacemaker is fantastic. It is so good. The humor works for me almost all the time. I love all the characters. They work so well off of each other. They play off of each other so well. I was most concerned with Vigilante and thinking he might get on my nerves real fast, but he didn't. I liked them all. The villains, the antagonists, the story, everything about it worked so well. I don't want to talk too much about it because I think going into it as fresh as possible, as unspoiled as possible, is best, as I did. But I'll say this. I never in my life ever expected to almost tear up watching an eagle hug a human being. But it, it happened. It happened. It didn't, it didn't quite reach the tear up phase, but it was very, very close. I was like, oh, oh my God. Oh no. Oh, 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 oh. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's very good. It's very funny. The intro is fantastic. It's so good. I almost didn't skip it every time, but you know, time is precious. I gotta, gotta, gotta save as much time as I can. And then the little sort of, they're usually, I, I believe, extended versions of scenes that they have at the end of each episode after all the, uh, the credits are over. Those are fun as well. This, this show has redeemed the character of Peacemaker, has made me like them, has made me like a lot of these characters. And it it feels like the role that Cena was made for. In the same way that another show I recently watched, Loki, Owen Wilson, who I don't usually like all that much or find him to be the weaker part of whatever he's in, I think he was fantastic in that show in a role that seemed written exactly for him uh, and that's the case here it's it's just so good it is so good but that's it in terms of what i've been watching now so today because I, I finished with my own meal peacemaker pretty early in the meal decided to re-watch or give another shot to top gun and that's just, I watched the whole thing. It's it's fine. Uh, there are really silly parts of it that I can appreciate on a this is so bad. Okay. Level. The romance is awful and whatever her name is, she is awful in it. Her acting in particular is terrible. Her line delivery, which is a serious moment. It's it. The way she delivers it, 
and, and in the context, it just feels like it should be, or like she's making light of the, the situation and joking. But when she says, you know, I just, I, I, I have to stay professional. I, I didn't want anyone to know that I've fallen in love with you. And I'm like, is she gonna is she gonna start laughing and they're like ha I'm just kidding no, I don't love you already we fucking barely know each other oh no she's serious oh well fuck but yeah it's part of my venture down some of the stuff that my father really likes or stuff that we shared together when I was younger that I have found a re not found a regain, but regained an appreciation for or have a different type of appreciation for because of what I went through with him and, and whatnot recently where these things that we shared together or things that he loved, I want to keep in my life uh, to have him uh, as a part of me when... You know, there are cases where we, we won't, you know, when he's gone or just, you know, whatever, 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 man, whatever, man. Let us move on to what I've been playing, starting with Chained Echoes. This is a JRPG, which I don't, it calls itself a JRPG. I don't like, there's something weird to me about using the term JRPG to define a a subgenre or, or define a type of game because it stands for unless I'm like it's the JRPG means Japanese role playing game, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, anime is Japanese animation. I wouldn't call even though the style is reminiscent of it, I wouldn't call Avatar the Last Airbender an anime. I don't I don't care if it looks like one. If it like if it looks like one and it smells like one and it tastes like one, doesn't mean it is one. And I think that's just a weird genre to place upon a game style. And I'm saying all this because this is a game that was made by a solo dev. Uh but a German solo dev, not not a Japanese solo developer. But that is, that is not really important because what's important is this game, Chained Echoes, is one of the best games I've played all year. It is probably my favorite game of the year so far, given uh, or keep in mind I haven't played some of the big ones like God of War or what is it called? What's it called? Elden Ring. You know, there, are, there are a lot of big games, big hitters that I have not played. But of the games I've played, this is right up there, if not at the very top. I've enjoyed the hell out of it. And what surprises me the most is that usually in these types of RPGs, it is the story and the characters that are pulling me or pushing me to keep playing when the combat, the battle system doesn't really do that much for me. I'm not a huge fan of turn-based combat. I adore the Persona games, starting with three, where where it became the Persona that many people know it for. I love those games. I love them for the story though, and the characters and the choices I get to make and the social links and all of that stuff. The combat, I couldn't care less about. I play those games on easy because I just wanna be in that world and consume every bit of it. But I don't care about the combat. And the weird and cool thing about Chained Echoes is that the combat system is what is pushing me forward and makes me want to keep playing. I, over the course of multiple sessions, would play for hours when I was just, I, ha I had no, it wasn't that I wasn't planning to play for an extended period of time, but I didn't go in with that mindset or anything. I just wanted to check out the game and then I got hooked with the combat. And the reason for this is because while it is a traditional turn-based 
combat game where everyone has their their action order or, or their their yeah just call them their action order and you pick between basic things like attacking defending skills or using an item what makes the combat always engaging and it's a super simple thing that's been added but it, it just adds an extra layer of depth that for me at least does wonders in in making the battle system way more engaging and fun to always partake in and that is the overdrive system and what this is is there is a bar when you are in any battle it starts off in the yellow and you're working your way towards the green section which is the overdrive section of the bar and the reason why you want to get into that section is because then you will take less damage you'll do more damage you'll basically just get buffed in a handful of ways so it makes sense to be in there but if you so the way you increase your placement on this bar is by performing any type of action not any type of action so performing an attack or using a skill will increase your space in this bar defending switching out characters i i, I never use items i never had a, a case or a reason to use items yet so i don't know what that would do but defending and switching out characters will lower your your placement in the bar as well as depending on the point in a battle it'll, it'll constantly be changing and certain types of skills will when you use them they'll lower your placement on the bar and it becomes this balancing act because you want to stay in the green you don't want to drop into the yellow because then you'll lose all the, the the buffs but if you keep attacking and, and not focusing on, on keeping and making sure that you stay within the middle so that you have more, uh, room to work with there's the red part of the bar at the very end and when you're in there and in, in that section you will take more damage and you will take a lot more damage so you want to stay out of that section uh, at all times and this simple system of one uh, of of using your various attacks and skills and, and defending at the right moment and doing things in a way so that you are always in that overdrive mode it makes combat so much more fun so much more interesting because it, it gives me something more to do than just okay attack defend attack defend it, it 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 seems so simple and so minor but it it does so much to make the combat way more fun and you also have an ultra move section i lost my lost my little little, little cheat sheet uh not a cheat sheet just the games i played the little list of them but there's an ultra move uh thing that you get a little later on as well which is a party uh mechanic or you fill this bar your ultra move bar by performing actions just attacking etc over the course of a battle it'll fill up gradually and then it's not tied to a single member in your party but just whoever is currently attacking whoever you're you're currently controlling if you decide to use the ultra move then you'll use theirs and these ultra moves are stuff that do significant amounts of damage to one enemy all enemies maybe perform major buffs and debuffs etc and are accompanied with their own unique animations which are pretty fun the one young ace pilot when you perform his ultra move which is damage to all enemies he builds this little tiny mech and it's it's fun the, the pixel art is fantastic 
music was all right. The story, the, the, the problem with the game, it's not even a problem. It's just that I really enjoyed the combat so much. But the story, what I've experienced, is pretty general stuff. I, it's not bad. It's well written. There are a few translation hiccups here and there, but nothing major. And they're, they're very seldom uh, few and far between. But the story, it's just, it's, it's okay. It's okay. But that's fine. It doesn't need to be great. I, I, I like the characters more so than the actual story that's happening. Uh, the, the story is of, you know, it's, it's a fantasy world. You've got a kingdom that there are a lot of things going on behind the scenes where different people and groups are trying to bring about war in a time of peace and, and, and the, the other part of the government that just, they want, they want to have peace, but then there are these people who are trying to manipulate and create these false claims so that people think this government killed this individual and, and stuff like that. And your group is this ragtag jumble mess of characters who stumble upon each other while doing their own thing and just kind of end up together by sheer dumb luck. And I really like the characters. The story, the story is good enough. That's what the story is. The story is good enough. The characters are much stronger. And it's just, it's really good. I'm excited to keep playing it. It's roughly a 30 to 40 hour game, it claims. It, it, one thing I'll say is that if you read up on it, it'll say that there are no random encounters. You can always see the enemies in the world. That That's true in the sense that you won't be walking around, say, the sewer and, and it'll flash, the screen will flash and then you'll be in a battle. That doesn't happen. But you can enter a room and end up in a battle because you just, you didn't know that there were gonna be enemies in the room when you entered it. Or you'll be walking in the sewer and an enemy will pop up out of the, the, the water. And it's not a random encounter because that, that encounter would always be in that exact section, but you still, you couldn't avoid it. So while there aren't the the really annoying random encounters there are still encounters that you will you will get thrown into even if you didn't want to get into a battle at that point but it's really really good uh i think it's i think it's only 25 dollars as well which is a fantastic price for how much you're getting there you occasionally have a few choices and, and they can affect the way things play out in minor ways. I haven't experienced anything that's super major, nothing that, for instance, would lead one to want to replay it or the way a, a choice could change. But when you're playing as this thief, the red succubus, for example, you have to go around stealing a few things as part of your introduction to her because at the very beginning you are thrown into all these characters on their own or groups of a uh, pair of characters before they all combine and, and, and come together but when you're playing as her and you steal a few things uh, before progressing with her story if you manage to do it in a way where you're not seen and you don't leave witnesses then you will get better loot in this chest at a certain point where you're trying to break into the, the, the castle to steal this orb or gem, I believe. And if you don't, if you fail, if you, if you left a bunch of witnesses, then this commander will tell his two recruits, man, you did a, you did a great job. You, know, you got all this information about him. You're, you can get some sweet loot from this chest and then you'll be left with nothing but some garbage in there. But yeah, 
it's it's very 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 good and i like the switching out characters another thing i really like about the combat and what makes it so that each battle is something that is a standalone thing it's it's something that you you can always focus on each individual individual battle on its own because your health and mana which is tp in this game your 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 mana your your equivalent to mana is called tp and i find that mildly amusing because of beavis and butthead you know tp for my bunghole but all of that resets at the end of each battle so you don't have to worry about healing yourself after a battle you don't have to worry about having a bunch of recovery items on you for in between battles you get to focus or each battle you never feel like you're at a disadvantage and i really really like that aspect about it too uh, i think there are just a lot of smart design choices in this game and i i couldn't be more surprised by how good it is and how much i'm enjoying it so chain echoes currently is between that and the, the gunfire reborn game or whatever it's called but i think i think i would have to give it to chained echoes as my game of the year so far because gunfire reborn is in my wheelhouse it's a, a type of game that i gravitate towards so it, it makes sense that i would like it and it just happens to be pretty good so i like it a lot chain echoes not 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 such a given that i would like it and definitely not at all that i would like it this much so good on you chain echoes i can't wait to play more i cannot wait to play more i just wish there weren't that it's just a bet the the timing isn't great because there's just so much to play and especially at this time of year when you want to try and get through as many potential game of the year candidates as possible but yeah, Chain Echoes, highly, highly, highly recommended. I think it's on all platforms. I played on the Xbox, all these on Xbox. But then next up, I played Wave Tail. Wave Tail is a very lighthearted 3D platformer with a heavy emphasis on surfing around. You play a young girl who lives on this island with your grandmother, and there aren't a lot of other people around in this, this base uh, on the ocean. There are a few other islands with inhabitants. And the basic crux of the whole thing is that this black smog, whatever envelops your area and you want to clear it. And so you just go around surfing in the water because you get like this smoggy shadow version of yourself, which allows you to surf on the water without a surfboard or any type of thing. You just sort of surf on top of the shadow. And you're just going around collecting these blue orbs, which you then use to power things and push away this darkness, whatever it was called again. And you'll fight enemies at times, which are really, really easy to, to, to defeat. The basic ones pose no threat you'll find or come across more meaty ones later that are, for example, ones like a bull, it'll charge at you and takes a lot more hits to, to destroy, but it's still pretty easy to avoid. There are some nice accessibility options that will give you, I think, infinite lives and a few other things. So it can make the game even easier. The problem with the game is that as fun as it is mechanically at its core 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 the surfing feels really really good it just feels great surfing around the the ocean and the game looks great it's got a really nice pastel color palette really nice style in general the platforming feels pretty good problems are twofold one there's a lot of screen tearing in the game. 
and this can be alleviated with VRR. I can't, I can't use VRR in my setup with the whole capture thing and how, how I have everything working, which is unfortunate. Is, you know, maybe I, there's, there are a few things I could do to make things work and I'm just, I don't want to, I don't want to do it because uh, it's just more fucking money to throw down the drain. But, uh, also there's, a, there's always been a part of me that looks at VRR and I think to myself, not everyone has access to VRR. So I should experience a game as not, not that everyone's going to experience it this way, but I don't think like to me, I, I have this weird, sure VRR is really nice, but at the same time, it's not something that everyone has. So you shouldn't design a game around it or expect that to make up for the fact that you have done something with the performance to, to make it not perform at, at, it, at its peak at 100%. But there's a, a lot of screen tearing. It It's not so bad that it makes me sick or anything like some other games, but it is noticeable. So that's, that's not great. But then the camera in tight spaces becomes a bit of a mess. But more so than that, what I find really annoying is that you also have this grapple, which you can use to hook in this currency you use for buying cosmetics, as well as navigating the environment and reaching spaces you wouldn't be able to just by jumping. And the, ju the jumping feels good. The double jump, or you have a double jump, which I feel, God, I love the double jump. Just, I'm not in this, I, the double jump of this game is good. But I mean, just in general, I love double jumps. If you can jump, you can let me let me double, let me double it up, baby. But the the grapple, which allows you to reach spaces you can't get just by jumping, when you are within range of a point of interest, a, a grapple point of interest, the camera. I don't I don't think it's a hundred percent of the time, but more often than not, a, a vast majority of the time. The camera wants to focus on that point to make sure you don't miss it, I guess. And because of that, there will be instances where you're moving along and the camera will just shift to one of these grapple points. And then where you wanted to go, where you were going, it just fucks everything up. And it's something I wish I could turn off. I don't believe you can. So I find that a bit annoying. But then the game itself is just... It's, it's really relaxing and super chill. And it's a, 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 a nice game to just sort of turn your brain off and play while listening to a podcast or something of that. Cause the story, the story is whatever, but as pleasant as it is and as fun as it is to surf around eventually just sort of got tired because it's so easy and so simple and the puzzles are so not in any way brain breaking people complain about the Kirby games being too easy this makes the Kirby games feel like Celeste I it's just it's so light and that's not a bad thing but it does make extended play hard because it's just it it doesn't ask a lot from you and then, and then the performance issues and the, the camera stuff that that definitely hurts as well but it's it's all right it's it's worth looking into but I, I would probably recommend checking it out when it is on sale and picking it up at full price the last game i played is raptor boyfriend a high school romance this is a visual novel where you play a young girl in a small fictional town in ontario canada and in it, 
you, you are someone who is suffering from anxiety. You just moved to this new town. You want to try and maybe, you know, create a, a new start for yourself, a fresh start for yourself, become a cool kid. And you could do this by choosing to become, uh, you know, act like a, I'm a rock star or make funny jokes or do pranks or whatever. And of course, there are romance options. And your romance options are a raptor. Of course, why why wouldn't the first is going to be a raptor in here? And then I believe Bigfoot and uh, a fauna, not a, a fauna, but uh, I play I played a bit of it. The writings. All right, but as as solid as the writing is, and as absolutely lovely as the art is, I love the art a whole bunch. The style, the art style, I think is fan freaking tastic. And you have a decent amount of choice thrown in there, but not not too much. It just doesn't do anything uh, in what I've played so far, outside of the fact that okay, yeah, there's 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 a raptor at this school, and it's from this prestigious raptor family who's been in this town for generations, and everyone knows about them. But there aren't any other dinosaurs there because why would there be? I mean, there's a raptor there, okay, but. Outside of that element of it, this, you know, Bigfoot is more like a myth, not a myth, not mythological, fucking, I don't know what, what word I'm thinking of. What are the, what are they called? I think mystic is one word, but it's not the one I'm thinking of. But outside of having these larger than life creatures as part of the story, it doesn't have much of a unique or strong voice, strong personality like stories similar to this uh, in outside me in, in other media like uh, The Edge of 17, Lady Bird, which I'm, I'm not a fan of Lady Bird, but I love The Edge of 17 or Juno. Nah, why did I bring up Juno? I brought up Juno because I heard somebody else mention uh, it, not regarding this game. But there just isn't a super strong, unique voice to this game in what I've played so far. Outside of, again, the, the Raptor Yeti uh, or, or Bigfoot things. So it's fine. But as someone who isn't the biggest visual novel fan, it's not doing anything... It's not doing enough to keep me invested in its story. And I also think, given that I am pushing 40 almost, I'm not as keen on gravitating towards stories of this nature. But if, if you're more in the age range of this, if that, that time in your life is more close i think you'll probably gravitate more towards this story i was definitely i'm i'm, a, I'm an anxious person I, I have a lot of anxiety issues and i can relate to the the feelings of unease during high school and not feeling like you really fit in etc but i'm so far removed from that time in my life that i i don't find it as it's not as relatable for me anymore. Or it's not something I really want to even think about. It's all right. It's all right. That, that's it in terms of what I've been playing. As you might have to, uh, been able to tell from how much I talked about everything. Chain Echoes is just... Chain Echoes is the, is, the, is the game. It's the game right now, baby. Baby. But uh, let, let's uh, get on to some Patreon questions. And then call it a show. So... From Lunchbox, what are your top five animated features? And I, I asked him in the comments if he'd like me to separate them between 3D and 2D. And he says, sure, fucking do it. You know, why, why not make more work for myself? 
So I knew about this question for a while and didn't really think about it until a little bit earlier today. So I'm not 100% sure that these are my yes top five for both 2D and 3D, but gut reaction for 2D. And he said I didn't have to order them, but I'm going to order them anyway because you can't tell me what to do, baby. Why? I'm saying baby way too much in this episode. I am sorry about all the babies. All right? I don't want a baby. So no more babies. But for 2D, my number one has to be Nazca, uh, the the Studio Ghibli movie that was made before Studio Ghibli exists. I fucking love Nazca so, so, so much. It's fantastic. It's beautiful. And it has such a great, strong female lead which I think a lot of people attribute to Princess Mononoke often as being like, oh man, this is a great thing. And uh, I think Nasuka fucking destroys Princess Mononoke. Not, not Princess. Is Princess Mononoke? No. Yes? Is that, is that the name of that movie? No. Yes. Wait, what? I am so confused right now. That has to be it. Never mind. I don't know. I'm moving on. But uh, number two is Beauty and the Beast, which I love in large part because of the music, but I also really like the movie. Number three, Disney's Robin Hood. Fan fucking tastic. Most underrated Disney movie. Love it to death. Number four, Loving Vincent which is a case, a rare case of a movie that I think is just okay from a story standpoint, but the visuals are so strong and so beautiful and so wonderful that I fucking adore it. It's a recent thing. I wouldn't be surprised if everyone else listening has never seen it or potentially also has never heard of it, but it is a movie that was made with the likenesses of a lot of the, of the actors who are portraying these characters, but it's it's all done in the style of Vincent Van Gogh art. So it's like bringing, you, you know, it, one in some cases is just done in the style, but then in other cases it's bringing his various pieces to life and it's fucking gorgeous and the way it was made uh, painstakingly by a whole bunch of artists each each frame its own piece of art it's just it's a beautiful 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 movie to to watch and i can't recommend it highly enough if you just appreciate the art side of animation and just art in general the number five ooh. I don't know. And I'm sure a lot of people would just assume that it has to be something like Aladdin or The Lion King. And I like those movies, but I don't love them. I don't think. I like I Want to Be Like You from The Jungle Book so much, but that song does not warrant that movie being super high up. What other 2D... And there, there are other anime that I could throw in there. Number five, number five, number five. I'm looking at my anime collection to see if anything stands out. Uh, yeah. Why isn't there a Bluey movie? Just give me a Bluey movie and I'll say that. I'll say... I'll say Pompoko just because... I really love that movie. I think it's super fun and super silly and is great for showing a side of Japanese culture that is very foreign to us with the Chinooki and their bald. But also, given the way it's structured, it's, it's just a very, very unique movie. And I think 
while its unique nature means it can easily not work for a lot of people, if it's something that works for you, you're going to have a blast with it. And it, it just, it's, it's different. I like it a lot. Then for 3D, number one, Tangled. Number two, Wally. Number three, Monsters Incorporated. Number four, The Book of Life. Number five, what's number five? What is number five? Woohoo! What is number five? Da, 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 da. Hmm. 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 You see that? I just like, it was like, boom, boom, boom. Tangled. Tangled is fan fucking tastic. Tangled is my favorite animated movie. If you don't. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I. The, the, the only negative about Tangled is that I think the songs are on the weaker side. But Tangled is so fucking good. I adore Tangled. Then Wally is great, but I, I think the second half is weaker. The first half is the first half of Wally is the greatest animated anything. The second half has some strong uh, strong parts of it, but overall is a, a fairly big letdown compared to the first. It's a, it's a, it's a definitely a decline in quality. Monsters Incorporated is just fucking so sweet and adorable and it's the one movie that whenever I watch it I think to myself maybe I do want a kid maybe I do want a kid and thankfully that thought leaves me as soon as I, I finish watching it and then Book of Life just great I like the use of modern music I think it works and it's got a great unique aesthetic and so it's just a great story I, there was a time when I would have said the Nightmare Before Christmas, but upon a recent rewatch, I realized I like the aesthetic. I love that stop motion animation. I just love stop motion animation in general. But the story doesn't do it for me as much as it did when I was a kid. And I, I still love some of the music in it, but it's just, it's fine. No, you know what I'll say? TMNT. That 2007, I think, 3D animated movie was a huge surprise and maybe the best Ninja Turtle thing ever. It is really, really good. The humans, this is the problem with a lot of TMNT stuff. The humans don't always look that great, but I think the the turtles themselves look great. The rooftop fight in the rain looks incredible. It still looks fantastic to this day, and it's just a really well told story. The story is good. The acting is great. It's just a really, really good Ninja Turtle movie, standalone movie where I believe Chris Evans plays, I believe Chris Evans is Casey Jones and Sarah Michelle Gellar is April O'Neil. And then you got Sam, what's his name? Rudy. He's Wrath. And I can't remember the rest of the, uh, the cast, but it's very, very, very good. So I'll say that's my number five. Dumb brand. I love me and my Ninja Turtles. And the last question we have is from Jedi. What are your biggest video game pet peeves? Well, talked about one earlier in this episode already. I hate, I hate screen tearing. Screen tearing bugs the shit out of me. Uh, I don't like that, but that's not, that's more of a technical issue than a design thing, which I think is, is more of what this question is getting to is you know some people really hate roguelikes or they hate this that whatever <laughs> i hate this isn't even that fair but to go to the visual novel side i don't like visual novels that don't give you any choice if a visual novel is purely reading with maybe a choice here and there i don't see the point of it existing as a visual novel 
especially if the the visuals if there's not a lot of animation it's just a lot of static shots and ones that linger on for a long time there was one i played recently that i remember that being the case and i'm like why is this why is this a visual novel i'd just give me a fucking book if you're not going to take advantage of the medium why is it a video game like no i hate that i <laughs> i hate games that don't allow you to change the controls at all so if they don't give you any means to change the controls and force you to use their control scheme don't like that i don't like this is something that isn't as much of a problem anymore but i really found it annoying and i still find it annoying when games do this if they have a story with voice acting if there isn't a a slider just for voice that bugs me because in many instances the sound mixing will make it so that it's hard to hear the the voice acting over the the background noise and, and whatnot that i want to lower everything and, and keep the the voice a little bit higher than the rest of the audio so when I can't do that, that was a problem with a lot of Grand Theft Auto games for a long time, or Rockstar games in general. I think until maybe four, maybe maybe even four had the problem, but I don't like that. And then, <laughs> don't. No, you know, I probably should have, you know, I saw these questions ahead of time and I probably should have thought about them, but I didn't because these past few weeks have been a freaking, they've been a thing, but my dad's home. My dad's home just for a few days now. Seems pretty close to his usual self. And I'm just, I'm just happy he's here at all right now. So that's all I got to say about that. And that's all I got to say about the, this podcast. That's going to do it for this episode of the Pixelated Sausage Show. Once again, I am Marcus. As y'all can find me on Twitter and pretty much everywhere at PX Sausage. Fucking, why did I say Twitter again? I don't want to say that. I find me pretty much everywhere at PX Sausage. If you'd like to find all my links of support, Uh, I'm like, eh, is that how I say that? But whatever. If you would like to find all my links of import, you can go over to pixelatedsausage.com slash PXS and find them there. That is, again, pixelatedsausage.com slash PXS. And if you enjoy this here show or any of the stuff I do and what have you, you can go over to patreon.com slash PXS and support me to support me and my nonsense that way. So, uh. It is again patreon.com slash pxs. Come on. Two more. That's all I ask for right now. Just give me one, two more before the end of the year. And I'll be ever so grateful and thankful. Because I just wanna hit I just wanna hit that milestone. Just do it for one month and then fucking bounce, alright? Jeez, but uh yeah. That is, that is it. That is all for uh, the show. So, uh, as always, thank you for watching or listening. I hope you enjoyed this here episode. And for now, adios. Uh, Riva Derchi. Bye.